I've had a wonderful day visiting many of you uh, here, and um, it's very rare to go to a place where astrostatistics is not a foreign concept, but is a functioning cross-disciplinary enterprise, uh, as you have here at uh, Texas A&M. So um, I've been uh, just totally uh, pleased, and I've learned a lot. Um, the first is an overview where you'll learn nothing. Uh, uh, there's no information. It's meant to sort of, uh, uh, assuming you are an astronomer, um, <clears throat> change your mind, change your perspective, I think is the way to phrase it, about how we do astronomy and how it can be viewed as having a, a very, very strong component of applied mathematics uh, and the branches of statistics and computation um, and the various successes and trials of it and where it stands today. So that's the part you're not going to learn anything. Um, and then uh, it involves planet detection, and photometric uh, transits, and the other is, <laughs> is um, I, I'm not doing any research. I simply teach it, uh, having to do with um, uh, spatial point patterns and clustering. Um, and that's to illustrate uh, some of the uh, broader concepts of the first half. <clears throat> okay, um, let's get rolling. Well, if we're going to talk about astrostatistics, we should say, well, what's astro and, and what's statistics? So astronomy for the last century has essentially been a conflation of two concepts. One is the observational study of planets and stars and galaxies and the whole universe. Uh, uh, and we call that astronomy, telescopes, and astrophysics, where we use the um, NH-alpha line from the 3 to 2 transition of hydrogen is the same in a lab in Texas as it is as a Redshift 5 quasar. And because of that amazing simplicity of the universe, we are able to understand uh, the physical nature and the physical processes and the evolution of cosmic objects, at least to some degree. This is a, 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 a continuing a dynamic enterprise. It's a very intellectual enterprise. <clears throat> so OK, what's statistics? So if you go ask 10 statisticians, you don't, you, get, you don't get an answer. You don't get a consistent answer. So uh, the founder of 20th century statistics, more important than any single astronomer, was named R.A. Fisher. So he dominated everything. So he wrote a book in, the, in 1922, The Young Man. And he said, briefly, in its most concrete form, the object of statistics is to reduce your data. And we understand that because, you know, we get gigabytes or petabytes of images and spectra. And it's just too much for a human to look at all those numbers. So we reduce it down to, to, to graphs and tables. And we reduce those down to a few conclusions at the end of a paper. And that's reduction. Wikipedia a couple years ago said, statistics is the mathematical body of science that pertains to the collection analysis. That's sort of what this is about, data analysis, but also interpretation or explanation, and also uh, visualization. And then a couple years later, they took out the word mathematics. I don't know why. <laughs> now, D.R. Cox is still alive. He's 96 years old, I think. In one of his early books, he wrote, this is not all of statistics, but it's a very interesting part because astronomers uh, do this. A statistical inference carries us from observations of a sample to conclusions about the underlying population. So I assert if you're a grad student and you're doing a, a dissertation on a couple hundred RLIRI stars and some nearby galaxy, that really you're not interested in those 200 stars. You're interested in the population of RLIRIs, of which these are the ones that you've measured. And in the case of stars in the Milky Way, I mean, there's a trillion stars. We never see all of them. Galaxies, well, 100 billion visible galaxies, and the universe is open. So there's an infinite number of galaxies. So obviously, we can't ever see the population. And um, they, they can't. We therefore need this kind of a constant, surprisingly pessimistic. Okay? Famous George Box died in his 90s recently, son in law of R.A. Fisher. Essentially, all models are wrong. Some are useful. 
Kepler's laws are wrong for a binary star? He never met an astronomer. He's spending too much time with psychologists, sociologists, okay, where the models are wrong. C.R. Rao is still alive, he's in his 90s. Fisher's last student, major work starting in the 1940s, most decorated and accomplished statistician of the 20th century. In his autobiography, he wrote, <clears throat> he quoted, I don't know if you know the history of astronomy, from the preface of Kepler's book from the 16th century. Uh, there's no need for the hypotheses or ideas to be true or any of it like the truth. Just lead the calculations that work. Okay? That was because the guy who wrote it didn't like the sun being in the middle of the universe. And Earth. But that was religious ideology. But the point is, why is he talking about it this way? And D.R. Cox says, an old man, the principles of statistical inference, his last of 20 books. The object of statistical inference is to provide critical analysis and even this, as far as feasible, the interpretation of empirical data. The extremely challenging issues of scientific inference involve synthesizing different kinds of conclusions to a coherent theory and the use, if any, of quantitative notions of probability in the numerical assessment statistics is unclear. Oh, let's go home. I mean, you can look through the telescope as much as you want. You will never understand your stars and planets and galaxies, if you believe these guys. Well, all I could say is, I don't believe that. Most of physical scientists don't believe that they can't access reality. So we are what are called positivists. So here's, a, he's less famous. He's a retired radio astronomer from, from Canada, very nice guy, Phil Gregory, wrote a lovely book on Bayesian inference for physicists and astronomers. And he, let me read from his premise. <clears throat> Two paragraphs. The first one, standard uh, classical um, philosophy of science. The goal of science is to unlock nature's secret. Understanding comes to the development of theoretical models that explain existing observations and make testable predictions. 1950s theory. Now, this is the one that's interesting. Fortunately, a variety of sophisticated mathematical and computational approaches help us through this interface from astronomy to astrophysics. And they go under that general heading of statistical inference. So if you believe that, that what astronomers do when they reduce their data, they're doing statistics, and when they interpret the data from astronomy to astrophysics, they're doing statistical inference. In other words, we're statisticians. We just think we're statisticians. So this is interesting to me. You know, it, it leads to another perspective. It suggests that we maybe should not take statistics as just useful mechanical tools, but, but maybe something that is part of our intellectual enterprise. And then when you take it more seriously, you find out that statistics is rich and vast and complex, intellectually challenging, and incredibly capable, far beyond what most astronomers know. And that's the point of my lecture, part of my lecture. So after hanging around statisticians for 25 or 30 years, this is what I've summarized. It's basically just implements these ideas a little more precisely. The applications of statistics can, I think, reliably quantify information embedded in data. And then I thought, well, D.R. Cox is not a fool. He's not a fool at all. Um, let's not say we can decide on the theory. How about adjudicate the relevance of theoretical astrophysical models? Okay, maybe a little cautious on the interpretation of the discussion sessions. But it's not straightforward. It's not just, eh, do this, get an answer. That's right or wrong. First, uh, Ari Fisher is famous for saying, let the data speak for themselves. I would call this non-parametric approach. Don't put a model. Don't make a preconception. Look at the data, maybe in summary form, to see if it has structure, if it has outliers, if it has maybe some characteristics you didn't expect, or maybe it looks just like what you want to. Then what is your scientific problem? State it carefully, uh, conceptually. 
my goal is to find the, you know, the periods of these RLI rays to find the distance to the stars. You're allowed to have multiple goals, each with different statistical approaches. No one stops you from asking questions. <laughs> That's the same. Then you formulate it, not all the time, but if you go this far, as a model, a statistical model, probability model, in mathematical form. And this may be motivated by astrophysical theory. It might be heuristic, like a linear or power law if the variables are long. And, and, and then, you, then you choose a statistical method and you calculate the slope of the power law. Uh, most astronomers sort of whip through these early phases and jump and calculate. They think, well, first of all, you never have to write a statistical subroutine the rest of your life. It's all been written. It's in R, a language which maybe you don't know. You're a physical scientist. Calculations scattered through all the sci pods and stat pods. Uh, R, nobody knows, has at least 100,000. It grew exponentially for 12 years. It's now growing, I don't know, quadratically. There's six new packages coming in every day. It's huge. It's bigger than SAS. It's the biggest piece of software for statistical computing in the world. And it's free. And for those of you who know other languages, it looks just like, syntactically, MATLAB. And it looks like IDL. So it doesn't take an astronomer, young astronomers. You tend to learn it, when I teach, in about two hours. The stat statisticians don't bore you. I said, don't, don't worry. Go fast. Go fast. They're really good at software. But you're not writing code. You're just scripting and calling these 100,000 subjects. And then, and then, do what um, E.R. Cox recommended. Be cautious. Be thoughtful. Don't assume your statistical answer addresses your science question, clearly. Maybe it does, but maybe not. And so astronomers should be thinking more and coding less, in my opinion. Here's some more general thoughts, just from my experience. It's not always our fault. Okay? The statisticians, of whom I think a few are in the room here, my apologies, uh, it's very big. It's, it's just it's like a gigantic weed garden, okay? It's, it's just enormous. It's very hard to think for an outsider to figure out even what their question is. You have very specific jargon that we don't know. And there's usually several ways to proceed given, given things. And you won't tell us which one is the right one. And, 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 and it's all very confusing, guys. So, so you know, simplify your field and, and, and make it easy. But of course, it, you can't. It is truly a complex enterprise. Now, astronomers working around and doing things in statistics, did you know that some of the statistical procedures are based on mathematical proofs? And that was your assumptions. The data have to be IID. Among astronomers, how many of you know what IID means? Oh, that was three of you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. That's, like, that's like saying thermodynamic equilibrium to them. I mean, you're supposed to know that. It's taught in I don't know, first semester means independently and independent and identically distributed data. Well, guess what? Sometimes we have IAD data and sometimes we don't. And if you don't and you do a, a, a procedure that requires it, you, you get an answer that is wrong. 2 plus 2 is 5. Is wrong. Don't violate mathematical truths. Sometimes they're not quite sure. They have competing theorems. Should I use the Bayesian information criterion or the Akagiki information criterion for model selection and the likelihood of format? That's been debated for about 40 years. And they can't decide. There's theorems on both sides. There are theorems on both sides. Okay. Sometimes, rarely, this is it's fun. I, I think I have this right. They have a theorem that there is no theorem. So it's cool. go look it up on Wikipedia if you get bored. The no free lunch theorem 
of machine learning classification from the 1990s. That if you take a support vector machine and a random forest and a neural net to a given problem, you don't know which one's better. So the problem is that astronomers just are lost in this complicated world of advanced methodology. So one thing things I advise is do things after you do your analysis and you come to your science conclusion, try a couple more options in Bayesian statistics. Um, um, try different priors. But even in the other ones, just try different procedures. Uh, jiggle things. <laughs> and see if your science changes. And if your science result depends critically on your choice of methodology, uh, don't be happy. Okay? Worry that your science conclusion may not be reliable. Uh, so science inference should not depend on arbitrary choices of methodology. I'm worried about taking logs of variables. So we take logs of certain variables because it's habitual. It's, it's familiar. It's convenient. You don't want the science conclusion to depend on whether you transform your variable or not. Will it, it depend? It depends on the method. In classification, uh, our random forest decision tree will not depend on the scale. But a uh, hierarchical clustering will depend on the scale. <sighs> what do you do? I, I don't know. It's complicated. But you need more sophistication to think about this than most astronomers are, are have been doing. And then be cautious about the conclusion. Statistics is just a tool. You're really an astronomer. You're trying to do astrophysics. And sometimes a three sigma result has no meaning. Well, I'm not sure. Sometimes you get science result out of a null result, a null statistic result. So we should be increasingly knowledgeable about this vast field of statistics and increasingly judicious in not making rapid conclusions easily. So spend more time and more time in expertise uh, in doing statistical analysis. Okay, that's what I've learned in 25. Okay, let's very briefly talk about the past. Uh, essentially, astronomy was the first science. So let's go back to the ancient Greeks. Hipparchus tries to estimate the length of a year, 365.25 days in a year. If you don't get the 0.25, your calendar goes bad in a millennium. Look at the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar. Right? Okay, so there's two ways of doing it. You either build Stonehenge and measure it every year, very expensive, probably cost a billion dollars in Bronze Age money. Or you measure it a few times, and then you have discrepant values, 363 days, 367 days. What do I do? Pep Parker says, take the minimum one, take the maximum one, just go to the middle. Now, it's not stupid. It's not a bad idea. But we don't do it today. Because if one of the 10 measurements is really bad, called an outlier, that, that, no, it's a bad estimate. So in medieval times, some theologians said, observe it once and stop. Then you know the answer. <laughs> now, that might have suited some religious beliefs, but it's not stupid either. There's an appearance that you make more and more measurements, that they just the range just increases and increases. So it was Galileo in the dialogues who recommended the mean. Tycho Brahe used the mean. The founders of modern physical science and astronomy, they said use the mean. Add them up, divide by n. So now you go to 10 statisticians today and say, what would you do to find the middle value of 10 numbers, measurements of a cons physical constant? They said, well, you can do that. that all. How about the median, the middle value? I said, well, why that? It's most robust against outliers break down of 49%. Half the data can be wrong and the median's still right. Uh, but we say, well, I like the mean because I really like the standard deviation. And they said, well, well don't you know about the bootstrap? Uh, yeah, well, there, there's a standard, there's two of them. There's another one called the mad. So the median has a confidence interval. It's just it's not as well known. Okay, so that actually shows that even the simplest idea is still being debated after 2,000 years in statistics, in the interface between statistics and physical 
physical law. Okay, in the 1800s, Newton had written down these fantastic equations that are completely right. And they were doing know, orbits of Saturn's moons and comets and mutation, mutation of the moon and stuff. And it was being done in the 1800s by Simon Laplace, and Adrien Legendre, and Carl Frederick Gauss, who was chairman of the astronomy department. Uh, that was his job. Uh, and they developed these squares of regression. And, and the Gaussian distribution, which used to be called the astronomical error distribution, and astronomers basically were the statisticians throughout the 19th century. But then the two fields diverged. The statisticians discovered, or were discovered by, are basically human affairs. So political science, politics, military, manufacturing, agriculture, mag you're in ag and mining school. Was there early statistics at this university? Agriculture and mining? There was at Penn State. Okay. Uh, and medicine. Okay. We discovered there was more to physics than just gravity. So they discover quantum mechanics. We do spectroscopy for our stars. Uh, they discover uh, 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 relativity. We do that in our, in our stars and our black holes, uh, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we became astrophysicists. And they became social scientists, quantitative social scientists. And by the time I came around, I had to learn statistics for X-ray astronomy. I was pointed to a technical appendix of a nuclear physics book for the Poisson distribution. So I got one hour of training in statistics in my graduate career. Uh, so the state of astrostatistics today is is lousy. Okay. Many astronomical studies use just a narrow suite of Fourier analysis and Kamogra Smirnov test, E squares regression, something called chi, minimum chi squared regression, which nobody else uses. It's not totally stupid, but it's, 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 oh, it's limit, useful only in a limited number of situations of astronomers don't use them. And they, we misuse them. So. And these are some of the things in the 20th century that we collectively missed. Maximum likelihood estimation and the EM algorithm, the BIC for model selection. We missed linear discrimination, discriminant analysis, support vector machines, cards, and random forest for classification. We missed autoaggressive modeling and state space modeling for time series, but we did do three analysis. We missed Ripley's K for spatial force processes because we did the differential of it. We called it the two-point correlation function. We missed Krieging. And geostatistics. We missed survival analysis. That's how I started my career. I walked over to STAT. I was an assistant professor. I said, what do I do with these upper limits in my x-ray brightnesses? And I drew xy points with arrows, pointed down, and her eyes widened. Head of statistics consultant. She reached up to her shelf, pulled out a book, and my picture on her blackboard was the cover of the book upside down. They had lower arrows. And she said it's a field called survival analysis, relatively new, post-World War II. And the course started two weeks ago. So I took the course. I slept through all the theorems. And the professor and I wrote a couple papers for the Astrophysical Journal that summarized the, the book, multiplied by minus one, and changing the name, the word, the noun, from survival the luminosity. Best papers of my career. Thousand citations. Okay. I didn't do anything. I walked over to the stat department. <laughs> so that's what got, made me realize that statistics can be invaluable if you're willing to spend the time, learn their jargon, make a lot of you know, dead ends, and mine their world of methodology for our scientific purposes. So we summarize that, catching up with 20th century statistics in our textbook, Modern Statistical Methods for Astronomy with R application. R is a software package that they wrote roughly in the, 19, uh, the 2000, same era as Python. But it is all of modern statistics embedded in R. 
this slide I'm not going to read, but here in black are some major problems in a field called cosmology, which is like the queen of astrophysics. Very important to have cosmologists in this room here. And then I thought, well, what is that problem called if a statistician were to call it? Label. And when a statistician looks at this list in red, they say, you need all of that? Because those are all different courses in their graduate curriculum. This is, you, you need a PhD in statistics. And we say, I say, yeah, <laughs> well, I guess we do. So it's actually very hard to write this book usefully. It's too broad. And there's another book in Python by Ivichik, the same chapter titles as ours, same, same, same book written somewhat differently. And uh, but that's, such, that's one of the reasons why statistics are hard for astronomers, because it's so diverse. But at the same time, I personally would turn that point around and say, that makes it interesting. Statistics is not boring. Statistics is how you are a good astronomer and try to do good astrophysics. Well, it's certainly a very important aspect. But it's not simple. And it's good to get advice. Statisticians love consulting with other people. OK, things were lousy when I was young. But things are definitely getting better. A resurgence, a re-emergence. Say 1810s were important, and the two and the 2010s were important, but 1910 was lousy. First of all, we have better software. R and CRAN is available. I can teach it to the grad students. In two hours. Python's pretty good. Maybe I don't know, 10 percent of all. The papers in astronomy have doubled or tripled with those keyword methods statistical, all by themselves. Astronomers are increasingly interested in statistical methodology. Okay. Oh, we've been giving a course for 13 years at Penn State, one week course in statistical inference for astronomers with our training. And it's still popular. Every year we say, oh, no one's going to sign up. And <laughs> we fill the class. Uh, Jogesh is, oh, my colleague is Jogesh Babu, professor. Roughly the top guy is a fellow of the IMS, fellow of the, of, the, uh, of, of the ISI, fellow of the ASA, fellow of the ASSS. In other words, my colleague is a senior statistician of great ability. And he and I became friends and worked together for 25 years. <clears throat> so he's Indian. So he went to India and set up the summer school. I go around and give uh, tutorials, practical methods, methods and and, and and R to and, and, and software tutorials at meetings and all that. Uh, there are some collaborations. I did. I put it in last night. I put it in Houston last night. Okay, because I was intuiting that you guys were moving forward. I I'm I'm take crossing that off. I'm going to put T A M U without a question mark. You are definitely a cross-disciplinary collabor research collaboration here of the highest order on a world scale. There's only a few others that are like you. Uh, and my congratulations for achieving that recently. And I hope you grow in that direction. A lot of conferences, either separate conferences that actually are devoted to it, fairly small, or else sessions in infor of informatics and statistics in astronomy meetings, big astronomy meetings, or sessions on astronomy in big statistics meetings. This is happening so many times a year. It's all in the last few years. Now, like a separate but related and even more rapid change is happening in astroinformatics. And that has to do with big data. Here's a little poem, statistics guides the scientists on what to compute. Informatics helps the scientists perform the computation. If you have a kilobyte or a gigabyte, you don't need a computer scientist, just do it. If you have a 
a terabyte or a petabyte, uh, you better find yourself a, stat, uh, a computer scientist to help. So here we go. I'm not going to read it. Computational choices of data mining, machine learning, Monte Carlo, highly efficient methods. How about order and less than less than n methods? I think those are needed. Uh, parallel processing, GPUs, database management, software engineering. Uh, there's just beginning the first international symposium in astroinformatics occurred a few months ago. So this is but and there's growing perception that training is needed here as well as in statistics. And there are new resources. There is our textbook and three others. Uh, there are several that are devoted specifically to Bayesian inference, a certain way of not only taking your data with an astrophysical model, often nonlinear model, and making astrophysical inferences, but combining it with prior knowledge, either from astrophysical theory or prior observations. And that messes up the simplicity of maximizing the likelihood. So there's more difficult computation, and there, it's a different sort of style of doing uh, you know, uh, parametric inference. We run a web portal. You can look for ASAIP uh, that lists meetings and jobs and, and forums and courses. Oh, the forums are dead. OK. I started, oh, I'm going to have a beautiful website where the status, astronomers will ask questions and the statisticians will answer. And it will be really vibrant. And nobody used it. And then a, a kid, a young radio astronomer in Western Australia, opens up a Facebook group. And he has 3,000 members and there's constant conversations there. So, oh. so a Facebook is very important, believe it or not. <laughs> Every international and national society in America, in statistics and in astronomy, have all formed special working groups in astrostatistics and astrophysics, all in the last five years. And one of the half of the publications in the world go through the American Astronomical Journal, the APJ, and they now have a new statistical scientific editor who happens to be me at the moment. And, 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 and so I'll, it, what I want to say is that there's sort of an environment that, that this resurgence is not sort of isolated to a couple academics who have some obscure interest. It's a, like, whoosh, it's a, it's a movement, mostly spontaneous, um, because people have big data. People realize they need more methodology. The old methods are inadequate. And they've collected uh, these people filling in and helping and supporting this new picture. So I end the first part of my talk with a vision. I'll say it on a bad day, I put in 2030 there. On a happy day, I put in 2025. I'm very happy today. Okay. We need a curriculum for the semester of astrophysics. Oh, for astronomy? That's it. A curriculum with a semester of astrophysics. And a semester of astrophysics. Penn State just got that this year. Some of us should get a separate degree, fully trained in statistics and computer science. We should get our agencies, NASA and NSF astronomy, to siphon 1% of the astronomy money into methodology the way the NIH has been doing for 50 years. Why do you think they're building some? Distinguished professors of biostatistics because NIH well, pays them. Statisticians are expensive. You got to pay them a lot because society values them. Okay? We have to fund astrostatistics, for instance, the way astrochemistry is funded. Not all of us should become astrostatisticians, a few of us. And the rest of us should know enough to use the tool in our and we, we do have meetings. So the statistical challenges in modern astronomy meetings have had this 120 people for 20 years. It hasn't grown. The number of people who identify themselves as methodologists is still small. And we need more. We need to grow fields so this really works. <clears throat> okay. Uh,
that was rough. You didn't learn anything. But maybe it changed your perspective on it. Okay, these are two examples of not pushing the envelope on methodology but using existing methodology that is simply maybe unfamiliar to astronomers to address some you know, serious astronomical problems. <clears throat> okay, we want to find planets orbiting other stars. And one of the main problems is that when you look accurately, this is from the NASA's Kepler satellite, when you look accurately, the stars are bouncing around for their own reasons, mostly due to stellar activity occasionally modulated, quasi-periodic, autocorrelated. In fact, here's the autocorrelation function. Here's the partial autocorrelation function. And you can see that there's short and long memory components to these effects. And there's 200,000 of these. This is only a little bit of the data. 200,000 with 70,000 points each. It's a wonderful data set. If you're a time series analyst, this is like, like heaven. <laughs> okay. But they're messy. And they're messy in different ways. So how can you deal with this in order to find the planets? The planets, by the way, are making little tiny box-like dips as the Jupiter or the Earth goes in front of the star. Only a few percent of the stars will happen. So we're using parametric. Most people use non-parametric, either wavelet transforms or Gaussian processes regression or independent component analysis or a few other single processing tools. We're doing parametric modeling, linear regression that the value uh, at, at time t is linearly related to the time t minus 1, t minus 2, and these others with a, a Gaussian term. But the Gaussian term is not just passively creating noise. The Gaussian term itself is autoregressive on itself. So when the system is getting a, a jiggle up, that, that jiggle causes changes in x. And we add these two together, and that's called ARMA, ARMA, ARMA PQ is like three and Q maybe seven. How many terms you have in it. And then if you add something called a differencing operator that simply is like a first order differential of the time series, then you get ARIMA PDQ. And ARIMA is a simple regression. Just run maximum likelihood and find these coefficients and you have ARIMA. And it is amazing. I just couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, maybe we'll try Arena. Maybe we'll work on some of the stars. It's like fabulous. And then I went to Google. I typed in Arena. 1.5 million hits. A lot of other people have found that Arena's are powerful. It's a broad, powerful family of, of linear regressions, which are called stochastic autoregressive models. And they simply work. So, here's the data. The range here is about plus or minus 40. Here's the residuals. The range is now plus or minus 10. The autocorrelation functions are clean as a whistle. White noise. Might even be Gaussian. Oh, I must have worked really hard. I typed in, install package forecast economists version 50. Auto Arima, carriage return. Four CPU minutes later, it plots the set. I don't do much coding. Entire dissertations are a few hundred lines. That's R. You know. Okay, the problem is that we really want to find in the residual these boxes. But when we did the differencing, the boxes became bloop, bloop, right? It goes down and then it goes back to zero during the duration. It goes up in egress. So now we have to look for this. And so instead of box these squared, we look for bloop, 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 bloop. And my student, Gabriel Caceres, develops Tensicum Fulk. He's a brilliant programmer and he's getting a master's in engineering along with a PhD in astronomy. He, he just really understands this far better than I do. And we started off with this original data. This is how many of the Kepler stars log had what range, an interquartile range, this is a factor of a million. And this huge number of them were like way, had thousands and tens of thousands of correlated noise. And when we difference them, 
we come here and we run a Rima and a FEMA, we come here and we're able to basically bring them down to a much a cleaner level and then we look for planets and the residuals. So we run these periodograms based on the transit home filter. I'll show you one in a minute. And then we say, okay, we have a training set. The Kepler team already spent years and years with them, and hundreds of thousands of lines of Python and who knows how many thousands of hours on the CPU or called supercomputer called Deity. Um, we have a, a training set of of confirmed planets from the Kepler objects of interest. So we look at the strength of the periodogram, of the first peak, the main peak, and we can say, what's the true positive rate? We can get 80% of them, but oh darn, 20% of them are false positives. Now, that wouldn't be so bad if it was a balanced classifier problem, but only 2% of the stars are have planets. So we're letting in a flood of mistakes using this classification. So Gabriel Cassaris, again, used a, pulled out a dozen features from light curves, from stars, from periodograms, ran a random forest probability. I said, Gabe, I said, is it hard to run random forest? He said, no, it's one line of R, carriage return. In that case, five seconds, done. And he got this curve. He's able to recover 85% of them with only 2% false positive. That's power. That's good progress. So we started with autoregressive modeling, went to a single processing filter, and then did a, multi, a, a, a machine learning classifier. And here's the result using the period of the stars. This is for about 20% of the Kepler data set. <clears throat> so <laughs> all these periods here, are these black dots here, are just noise. These are, you know, 39,000 <laughs> plus of them are, are just noise. The red squares are the training set that we know are right. And you can see that we will use the green line criterion, arbitrary. We can capture 98% of them. Well, that's not new. We trained on them. We captured them. That's sort of like a circular reasoning, but at least we got them. The interesting thing is that we seem to capture some new ones they missed that looked like planets. And those are in blue diamonds. The little gray ones on top, those are our false positives. There's not that many of them. And we haven't finished the dissertation yet. We're going to try to get fewer gray dots in there. For those of you who happen to be exoplanetary astronomers, you might be a little surprised. These here, even though all of these, are called ultra-short periods. 20% of the data set, we have a dozen of them. We may come up with 100 ultra shorts. Wow, that may be the main scientific value of Gabe Cassius's dissertation. It's ultra short planets. Can be. So that's really exciting, <clears throat> scientifically. But he and I are methodologists. All we care about is methodology. Okay, so here's the typical periodogram. Oh, it's not this one, not typical. This is one of the blue diamonds. There's a peak there at 12 days. Notice there's a secondary peak at 24 days. Ooh, a harmonic. That's good. Okay. And we fold it, the ARIMA residuals, and we get chup, chup. And we actually look at the original light curve, and there's a little box. A little dip. So this is an example of one that we will report to the community as a candidate point. Now, some of you, many of you, it cost $700 million to build Kepler. For $1 million, you can do a survey like that on the ground with a small telescope in Chile or Arizona or Namibia. And, but you get very crappy data. The cadence is bad. Every day, the sun comes up and you've got to turn off the telescope. Every six months, the sun comes up. You can't look at that stuff. You get annual and diurnal, and then every once in a while a cloud comes, even in Arizona. And you've got to turn the telescope. So you get these really bad cadences, they're really nasty. The atmosphere is always going crazy on you, and it's just full of outliers. And you run something called TFA, and you hope that it cleans it up, but you don't really know. <sighs> these poor people doing ground-based surveys have a lot of trouble. Here they are. 
is actually like this. Several hundred astronomers around the world do this. So we ran our software on it. We first we converted it, drizzled it onto an evenly spaced data set. We put in NA not available for the empty, empty gaps. We ran a REMA. It actually picked it up. I don't know if you can see, it's about a factor of three smaller. It still was noisy in the autocorrelation function, but we did get the noise down. We then ran a periodogram. We got a peak at three days. And that little cross on top is the published peak. This is a known planet from the Hat South Survey. We got the period right to within five gigs precision. And we folded the original data, and there it is. Boop, 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 there it is. We seem to be able to recover two thirds of the Hat South planets easily. So we're going to talk to them about doing the whole data set from our supercomputer, five million stars and see if we can find more half-south of planets. So this might work. Um, that's not my business. No, I'm not an astronomer. I don't care about, I'm an, just a mathematics. Matt, this is mathematics. Okay. Uh, you're correct. We should never have shown so many. You, thank you. I, I tell my students not to do that. And my student made this, and I, I didn't tell him. Oh, we, I, we don't know yet. This is impact. This, no, this, this is, this is, this picture is four weeks old. Sorry. <laughs> we haven't done the random forest for the hat south. I actually think that's the most challenging part of the path. <clears throat> uh, this is a 2018 project. We just began. Okay. So I used modern well-established time series methods, modern, well-established machine learning classification methods, and we recovered with great ease. One grad student, one faculty member, a couple statisticians looking over our shoulder. We recovered an entire NASA platform and maybe made some modest new discoveries. Easily using modern methods. Okay. I'm approaching the end of my time, but I also have only two slides here. I don't do research in this area, but I thought I'd do it because <laughs> some of you do research in this area, okay? If you're interested in the non-randomness points on a two-dimensional diagram, maybe it's right ascension and declination, and you have locations of stars looking for star clusters. That's where I do my my astronomy work in the star formation regions. Maybe you're an extragalactic astronomer. You have a third dimension called precessional velocity. And then you can find great walls and voids and filaments and large scale structure. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> that's fabulously interesting. Maybe you're a stellar astronomer and you have a color magnitude diagram for galaxies. And you discovered in the 1990s the red sequence, the blue cloud, and the Green Valley, the Green Valley. Okay. Positions in a 2D diagram. Actually, they had combo 17. It was actually 17 dimensional data, but they didn't use that. Maybe you're doing color color diagrams. In my field, class one, class two, class three, protostars are done by putting polygons in color color diagrams. Heuristically, they just make them up. You know, it just looks like. And it goes on and on and on. It doesn't have to be spatial variables, but sometimes it is. Just not random distribution. So generally, astronomers have a fairly conventional way of doing things. They want to find clusters, individual clusters. They use the friends of friends algorithm. No, because they don't know statistics. It started in 1976. Two Harvard professors. A new algorithm. Excuse me. It's called single linkage, non parametric hierarchical clustering, it comes from the 1950s. And it's totally known at the undergraduate level in statistics. And it's not recommended. At least it doesn't work very well. They recommend average linkage or Ward's method or a couple other things that are similar, that give different science results. <sighs> Astronomers didn't know this. 
So for decades, they've been publishing catalogs of, oops, catalog, galaxies, of dubious scientific meaning. And they still do. Or they run the two-part correlation function to characterize sort of the overall clustering in the whole picture, the whole survey. Not wrong. But it involves arbitrary bins. And the error analysis is not simple. Square root of n is wrong. Wrong. You cannot put the square root of n of a histogram from a two-part correlation function because they're not IID. So what are you supposed to do? Well, the statisticians, more or less simultaneously, starting in the 1970s, have developed the K function, which is the integral, the unbinned integral of the two-point correlation function by Brian Ripley, distinguished retired professor from Oxford. <laughs> and they have a bunch of others. And then they just invent things. In my field of protostars, they invent the Q statistic and the lambda statistic. And they're based on the minimum spanning tree. And then they don't know, they don't calibrate it. They don't know how to calibrate it. And they, well, they think one measures fractality, but they're not sure. And they're trying. And astronomers are trying to do things. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to say to astronomers who happen to deal with spatial clustering situations is to read this book. It happens to be 800 pages. Mathematics. It actually is made for practitioners. There's not much math in it. It's mostly a cookbook. One of the most remarkable packages in R called Stat Stat Spatial Statistics. It has like a thousand operations or subroutines. So, for example, I decided to bring up some of these. For just smoothing and making maps, we use smoothers. They do. Kernel density estimators, Voronoi tessellation smoothers, alpha shape and convex skulls, which are very difficult actually, and others. They have hypothesis tests of whether or not those are consistent with random distribution, called complete spatial randomness. And here's the names of some of the tests. It gets probability. Non-parametric. All non-parametric. Now, mark variables are very important. You take your galaxies, or your RLI rays, or your whatever it might be. And you measure their position, but you also measure their magnitude and their metallicity and their star formation rate or something. Those are called mark variables. So sometimes you want to make maps, smooth maps of the mark variable. That's called Kriegian, which also give variant uncertainty maps of the first type, or relative risk maps for ratios of two of them, or segregation and other advanced tests and diagnostics relating to the relationships of mark variable values and their locations or their cluster. This is very common in extragalactic astronomy and stellar astronomy. And then here's the pair correlation function, which is what they call the two-point correlation function. They also have the K function, the J function, the L star function, and the E function and the G function, each of which tell you slightly different things, or even very different things, about the spatial distribution pattern. They also tried, this is not easy even for them, to get confidence bands around the key functions. They used the block bootstrap approach, which was published in the AppJ in 2007, and no one's reading the AppJ paper. Because no one knows the name of the statistician, not a distinguished cosmologist, but an unknown statistician who happens to be right. I mean, he actually knows what he's talking about. Ji Ming Lo, professor in New Jersey Institute of Technology. So this package has hundreds of functions that might improve, and I actually think might even revolutionize problems and issues in extragalactic, galactic, and other branches of astronomy. And um, I, I would say uh, I would leave these books for you, but I'm pleased to say that 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 Casey has a copy, <laughs> and your library does. And uh, uh, John Way uh, showed me that, that he has a copy of this in his. And, and, and so you, you and the, li the library has another copy. It's quite possible, in fact, you have electronic versions in your library of both of these. These are two books. Our center has a library of about 100 books that we've selected out of many more that we think that astronomers can use. That's to give you an idea of the scope of modern statistics.
first one. Okay, I'm definitely finished now. Uh, I gave you two examples of application of established but advanced methods for modern astronomy. Thank you very much. Um, okay, well, things are always complicated, okay. So um, some of these are going to be in MIT's circuit. So we've recovered some of MIT's circuit. And they did it completely differently, different mathematics, different from the Kepler team and different from ours. So that's really good news when different mathematics come up with the same science result. So not all of these are truly new. They're new with respect to the KLI list. Uh, that was Random parse classification is I can't decide whether I think it's magic or not. I mean, it, 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 it's just pretty remarkable. It not only pulls out improved signals from multivariates, but it even tells you which variables are not interesting and throws them in the garbage. And, and so it, you can actually, what the nickname is, throw in the kitchen sink. You can throw in all sorts of crappy, collinear, and useless variables. And do a carriage return, and <laughs> it sorts it out. I think it's magic. Physics. I think we need tracks in the graduate curriculum. And we need a core curriculum that every graduate student takes. And those of us who want to become instrumentalists maybe should take some engineering. Those of us who wish to become Theoretical astrophysicists should take advanced physics, absolutely. Those of us who want to become data and survey uh, astro observational astronomers, maybe we should take more statistics and mathematics. Uh, the field is too complex to have one track. I will tell you. If it's monthly notices or ANA, I have no suggestion. If it's APJ or AJ, just go back to your scientific editor and say, could you please ask your statistician editor, here's my question. And then it comes to the statistical editor. That has been in place for about 16 months. It's new. It's part, I don't know if you know, but the journals went through a lot of structural renovation. One of the minor re renovations was to create this new position. You can ask that question to the editorial staff, and the editorial staff will try to help. That's why I want people to first do an MLE. That's what do their data say about the world, and then do MLE with prior knowledge of theoretical or observational. How does how does their data fit into the context of that? And then discuss. The hardest part of that, in my opinion, is the discussion. It's not obvious. Unless they completely agree. Then you say, the discussion is, it works great. Everything's fine. But if everything's not fine, then maybe we should worry. 